Good afternoon, and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series. I'm Eric Ouskerson, one of the hosts for today's webinar. We've been, we've been conducting this for the past couple of months. We greatly appreciate uh, being with you. We always learn a lot uh, from your questions, and it's a, a critical uh, time for us to connect and share with you all that we know. So first off, before I get into introducing uh, today's presenters, let me just cover a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with this platform. The bottom toolbar allows you uh, many capabilities to ask questions, to download the materials for today's event, and also there's a CPE button. Uh, at the end of uh, the webcast, you can click on that to get your CPE certificate, but don't worry if you don't get it now, you will receive an email uh, related to this. And you also can resize some of the screens here. So if you want to make uh, the, the, screen, the slides larger, you can do so by just you know, uh, clicking and dragging on that. Uh, so please do take advantage of these different capabilities. So today, uh, I'm Eric Ouskerson. Once again, I'm the president and CEO of CPA.com, and we're very focused on empowering firms you know, for the digital age and, and, and doing many different things uh, related to their client services. Uh, with, with me is Mark Koziel, who you all know, and he's been on every one of these uh, webinars. He leads the firm services area, and it's never been a busier time for him and his team, so welcome, Mark. Uh, we also have a practitioner. Uh, on most of our webinars, we bring a practitioner to explain how they're you know, managing through this business relief phase and just connecting with their clients. Uh, today, we have Dixie McCurley, uh, who's the president and co-founder of Trusted CF CFO Solutions. She's built one of the leading client accounting services practices uh, in, in the country, and she's, some, she's got some great insights on how they've been managing uh, through PPP and the broader business relief uh, phase. And then we also have Lisa Sinsom, and her team has been putting together all of the resources you've been leveraging, uh, such as the, the AICPA Forgiveness Calculator, uh, truly uh, has turned into an expert on PPP, so it's great to have Lisa with us, and she's been here on every event as well. So here's our agenda uh, for today. We're going to open up with just a brief recap of some recent town halls, because we think there's some good information there for you to leverage. We'll then go talk broadly about uh, where things stand, and then we're going to get into uh, the new the new forgiveness applications, the, uh, the the easy application, and and share with you our, our latest insights. Uh, we'll then have a practitioner discussion, and then move into open forum. But first, let's just talk about some of the town hall series materials and archives. Uh, that there's this button here uh, on the bottom toolbar that you can click. And we've got the most frequently asked PPP FAQs. So take a look at that document. You, we may have already answered the question you have today. And we also have a summary of the Flexibility Act. Here's what was covered over the last two weeks. Last week, we did a little bit of a deeper dive into idle and Main Street lending. So if you're interested uh, to learn more about that, you might want to go watch that archive. And then on June 4th, we actually did do a deep dive uh, related to the, the Paycheck Protection Program Flexibility Act, that new act, and we also talked about uh, some of the issues related to returning uh, to your office. Today, we're going to you know, really dig into the, the new forgiveness applications. Just a couple of comments about you know, the, the broader ecosystem. We have just been investing, investing in how we're connected to the government, the, you know, the firms, the information providers and the lenders. Actually today, uh, we have been in, in, in contact with all of these different groups uh, as we've tried to digest uh, this most recent information related to the PPP Act. Uh, and we're gonna be sharing, everything we share on these, uh, these webinars comes from what the AICPA has been able to determine, but it also comes from input from our, our AICPA-led coalition, which includes Paychex, ADP, Gusto, Intuit, and many others, the banking community, and, and Treasury and SBA. Uh, we've really increased our dialogue uh, with Treasury and SBA quite substantially over the past couple of months, and that, that's been very, very helpful. So where are we at right now uh, related to the major phases? We're right in the business relief phase. And there's just two comments 
that, that I want to make that we've been making a lot over the past, past couple of weeks. As we look at these past 100 days, uh, one statement we're making is that we, the firms have really, in some instances, done 10 years of relationship building with their clients. I mean, in this very intense experience, what's happened between the firms and, and, and your clients has been just outstanding. And the same thing goes for, you know, the broader ecosystem, and we're feeling that here at the AICPA. And then the other element is just this acceleration of technology. As we think about restart, we think about how we've been operating uh, since the shutdown. Uh, what, one thing we're stating is, you know, 2020 has become 2025, and, and we're going to see more technology capabilities come into play actually in the coming weeks related to this overall uh, forgiveness uh, process. So let's take a quick look at the latest SBA PPP numbers. Uh, once again, you look at the numbers and they're very consistent, they're very, you know, kind of consistent with what we've seen over the past couple of weeks. There has been a lot of new business loans. Uh, we do think that there's going to be a final surge as we move to this June 30th date, uh, but we do think there, there will be some funding uh, that, that's left over, which is fine. Uh, it's good that in some ways this was uh, funded sufficiently, uh, so there was, there's no issues in it, in it running out. What is the latest uh, related to, you know, the policymaker and regulatory discussions? What, what you're probably reading a lot about is, you know, PPP2. Uh, there's a uh, there's a couple there's a bill in the Senate and a bill in in the House related to um, a, a next phase PPP program. This next phase program is is clearly going to have lots more restrictions uh, and tests related to it. So that's something you should you should take into account uh, and and really think about leveraging uh, the current program through June 30th. And then just related to the phase four business relief discussions, lots going on there related to the CARES 2.0 Act or phase four, whatever you want to call it. It's, this is something that's going to be a, a mid to late July, August activity. And there is a lot of feelings that there's, there's, there's still a lot of funding left in the phase three business relief. Uh, so that's just something we'll continue to watch. This week, there was a House Small Business Committee hearing on the PPP loan forgiveness process, you know, concerns on making sure it's, uh, it's simple enough. Uh, that was one of the big themes. Uh, there's discussion about automatic forgiveness, but the, the people, the lot in, the lot of thinking at Treasury and SBA that the, the current easy form uh, makes this more straightforward. Uh, so to be determined there. And then there's also ongoing discussions related to Increased trans, uh, you know, level of transparency. Secretary Mnuchin last week stated that the names of the uh, who received the loans and the amounts was going to be kept confidential. Lots of back and forth on that, and we we continue to believe that some high level data probably will will be disclosed. But we'll continue to watch that. And as you see here in the media focus, uh, one article here, you know, Democrats accuse SBA of illegally blocking oversight of lending program. That's related to not giving uh, the specific information about who received these loans. So there's, there's going to be continuing discussions on that. And we think in the end, there'll be some type of compromise where there is some level of information uh, provided. And then th this other art article here, or this statement uh, from Congressman Annie Craig just highlights some of the new legislation that's being talked about for PPP2. Uh, but what we're focused on, Mark, right now is uh, the current uh, Paychecks Protection Program, and there's been a lot of developments over the past week. It's, it's been one of those sprint weeks, so why don't you, um, you know, provide uh, some broad context and then get into uh, these new applications? Mark? Sorry, I cut myself on mute. <laughs> uh, anyway, this slide. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, so this, 
so this uh, this flag we've had in for a number of weeks, uh, new guidance we get as a placeholder in case anything happens uh, that we can't report on or get into a full slide uh, before it happens or as it happens. Well, nothing new really today, uh, but if we do move uh, to the next slide, and, and before I actually go into uh, some of the guidance, Eric, to kind of expand on what you were saying about the privacy, I think one of the things to understand is, you know, FOIA is still around and that'll be bantered back and forth. And even if it uh, is fought uh, today to be as private as humanly possible, that doesn't mean that a few years from now, new administration, that things don't change. Uh, so there's always that possibility of things going back and forth. Uh, but ultimately, when they're talking about data, and I think the, the intent overall has been to protect the payroll data that is behind a lot of these calculations that's taking place, the individualized data. That doesn't mean necessarily, though, that, you know, your client uh, received a loan, that their name and the amount that they received uh, it doesn't become public, but they are going to try and protect the data that, that aligns behind it. And Eric, uh, my uh, uh, presentation manager is shot, so you're going to have to, uh, we'll reconcile as we go through. So if we, inter interim final rule, first interim final rule, this was published on June 12th. Uh, they uh, were trying to relieve some of the SBA loan or federal loan uh, requirements on uh, anyone who was convicted of uh, particular crimes. Uh, so they alleviated that. Not really much to talk about there, but if we go to the next slide, on the third and sixth uh, interim final rules uh, that were updated, you know, this one was big. And this is one that we were getting a lot of questions on uh, just last week as the Flexibility Act passed. You know, what's going to happen to the 24-week uh, period? Does that mean now if I was capped with a $100,000 or more employee uh, that I was still capped at the 15385 for uh, reimbursement? And they have now defined in this interim final rule that employees uh, will be capped at 46000 which is a 24-week period. Owner compensation, however, and owner employees are, are going to be limited to a, a number slightly higher than the 15,000, but still only at 20,833. And there was even some banter about that to say that, uh, you know, this act was to pay employees, not to pay off the owners, but generally to pay and for the benefit of employees. And this is going to be an important factor because we believe, based on this alone, especially in some uh, higher income markets, uh, uh, you know, you have New York City, some of your big cities, LA, uh, where uh, wages tend to drive higher, that we are going to get to forgiveness faster. Now, at no time are they ever going to give you more than what the loan application was that we originally received. But at this point, looking at this, we should be able to exhaust uh, the loan amounts that uh, the, a lot of our clients did receive in a hurry. Now, there's going to be the other tests that we're going to have to get. Lisa will get into some of those. Uh, she got some great answers uh, to some of her questions around it. But this, to us, was really a big deal uh, going forward. And I think, you know, we have to continue to assume positive intent. And this is proof to it. And I also think, based on the recent developments of the EZ application, and uh, a lot of the documentation and the relief that they're trying to provide, uh, it, I'm convinced that, you know, they are really trying to make sure that all loans uh, or as many loans as possible can get forgiven and that it still goes towards the payroll. So if you have clients that in the 24-week period, we know that they're going to hit the number. All your other questions regarding utilities, transportation costs, what's in this, what's in that, uh, really become less relevant if we know that we can hit it full in payroll. Payroll is the goal of the, the act. It's in the name. Uh, the more we can use it for payroll, get the loan amount exhausted, get the filing in, and, and get this over with, the better. Uh, I, I think that's really going to be an important piece as we go forward. So with that, if we go to the next yeah, slide. Mark, I'll move to the next slide, but just, I mean, this is huge. It's just really very, very significant. And we're seeing a lot of questions coming in, uh, even about, you know, when when should I start filling out the application? And it, just maybe just comment, 
as, as we go through this. We all want to digest it like immediately, but just some perspective on that, Mark. Yeah, so thanks, Eric, because it is. And it's, I'm glad to, to hear that that is part of it. I mean, you know, first of all, I don't even think the banks are ready to accept applications, right? The application just came out. There's going to be some technologies probably over the next week or so uh, that are going to, I think, help with this process. So I think, again, asking folks to be patient. Uh, you're probably not looking at much before mid-July-ish, I would say at best. And Eric, you know, correct me if I'm wrong on that. But at the earliest that we're, even if we have clients that, you know, we're fully uh, using the eight-week period, they're going to be able to use this easy form application, you know, that doesn't mean that the bank is going to be ready for it. And I do think talking to our clients, giving them the warning now, uh, Eric, do I dare give people the weekend off for July 4th? That holiday is coming up in a couple of weeks. But, you know, really, uh, communication is key with the client and say, you know, you've been on top of this and it's going to be mid-July before you can really apply. But starting to get the information together, working with the payroll companies, they're still not quite ready on what type of documentation they're going to provide. We're looking at a new application came out this week. FAQs are going to drop on this thing. We're going to get Q&As around this and samples around this. That's at least another week away. So at the earliest, we're probably looking at mid-July. Eric, any thoughts on that? Yeah, and I would, the only thing I would say, and then we can transition here to Lisa, is that the banks, one question, there are some banks that aren't taking new applicants right now in the final 12 days. We're going to talk about some, some fintech lenders that are, so you, you, you can leverage them. And I know there's still a lot of banks taking, taking applications. So the banks right now for the next 12 days want to focus on the current application process, and then, then they're going to move to this next phase of, of forgiveness so well said, Mark. And but with that, let's let's. But I think I think people are going to welcome you know what Lisa is going to share related to uh, the easy loan forgiveness guidance. Thanks, Eric. If you've had a chance to look at the easy loan application, it, it certainly does look simpler. You've got a, a um, one-page form plus some instructions and certifications, so definitely less daunting. I think that it's going to be a, a huge relief to self-employed borrowers who don't have employees. And um, then you've got a couple of other examples of, of when a borrower could use the easy form. So if you've got some, a borrower who did not reduce their number of their FTEs and did not reduce salary and wages more than 25%, they can um, check the box. If you've got a borrower who was impacted by these uh, restrictions around operations and weren't able to return to full activity that they had prior to February 15th, and they kept paying their employees, didn't reduce their salaries or wages by more than 25%, they can also check that box and, and apply for forgiveness. So that um, those exemptions are, are hopefully going to help quite a few borrowers be able to use this easy application. Um, there are, if, if there were calculations that needed to be done around FTEs or reducing salaries, you'll still have to maintain that documentation and um, you will have to submit some documentation with the form itself. And all of that is actually listed in the instructions, but it, again, it should be um, a much simpler process. We're hoping for a substantial portion of the borrowers. Next slide. I apologize. Slides aren't advancing for me, so um, I'll and assume that. Next one is the loan application there, Lisa. Thank you. So. Okay. Yeah, I've caught up now. So if you actually look at the um, the complete loan forgiveness application, I don't like to use the word full forgiveness application, even though that's the word Treasury used in one of its descriptions because it implies that you're going to get full forgiveness. Um, but if you look at the, the longer version of the application, you'll see that it is very similar. We And it answers some questions that we got a lot last week. A borrower who took out a loan prior to June 5th is going to indicate the covered period they're selecting, whether, whether it's eight weeks or 24 weeks, simply by indicating 
the covered period that they're choosing on the face of the forgiveness application. So the borrower makes that decision. The borrower inputs that information on the loan forgiveness application. That is their election. Um, you'll see that the FTE calculations bring in the new safe harbor that we just talked about with operating restrictions. Um, I think Mark or Eric used the word positive intent in a, in a previous comment. So in looking at that FTE reduction safe harbor about operating restrictions, you know, there isn't, it doesn't appear that there will be a uh, revenue reduction test. It will be looking at average business, business activity, you know, in the covered period. Was it impacted by these operating restrictions? And did that impact the borrower's ability to retain FTEs? Again, you've still got the salary and hourly wage component there, but you do have another safe harbor to consider. We also learned, um, I, I think, got some clarity around benefits for owner employees. If you look at the actual forgiveness application instructions around um, health insurance, you'll see that health insurance for S-Corp owners is not allowed as an eligible cost in the, um, in the um, non-cash compensation, which is the same treatment that self-employed and general partners are given for health insurance. The instructions to the um, loan forgiveness application say that retirement contributions for S-Corp owners are allowed as um, an eligible forgivable cost, which is not the case for self-employed and general partners. I know that had been a big question, um, so we're, we're glad to get some clarity around that. Next slide. Yeah, we've, but we've still got a few questions here, Lisa, let's, and hopefully we, we're, we're ready to answer them. So. Absolutely, um, kind of sort of. So just like everything else around the, the program, kind of sort of. Who is an owner employee? We expect that we will get an FAQ or an interim final rule explaining how um, owner employee will be defined for purposes of the PPP program. So just um, give us, give the treasury, uh, like Mark said, we might be getting those next week, but we do know that that is on their radar and they understand there are questions around it. We also have continued to get questions about how a self-employed individual who took out a PPP loan will, um, what documentation are they going to submit to apply for forgiveness? Um, I think we'll get some additional guidance around that, but it, it appears that it's going to be a pretty simple process for a self-employed person with no employees to indicate that they um, received, that, that they don't have to um, submit anything that shows their compensation for 2020. So it'll be a simpler automatic process for them. That's at least um, our current understanding. We've also got lots of questions point, around Lisa, Yeah, to that point though, on the general partner self-employed, you know, if they're paying themselves one checking account to the other, that makes it easier for the documentation. If they're using their personal checking as their business checking, hopefully we're telling them not to do that generally, right? Uh, but uh, if that's the case, the fact that they're able to, that's where they'll say that there will be generally no documentation. But I do think, you know, a, a canceled check to the partners or, or owner would be the, uh, should be enough substantiation to show that. Yeah, and it, we'll get some, some additional insights around that, we believe. Everyone's favorite question about what the heck is included in utilities and that encompasses transportation. We expect that we'll get some clear, clearer definitions on that in coming, um, coming FAQs. The last question on the slide, can a borrower apply for forgiveness before the end of the covered period has probably been the number one question over the past um, week or so. And, you know, I think there's still some clarity that we'll be looking for, but if it's our understanding that if a borrower has used their PPP funds, and let's say they have a 24-week covered period, 
and by the end of week 12, they've used their PPP funds. If they are going to take that safe harbor around um, operating restrictions and they've maintained their salary and hourly wage levels or haven't reduced them by more than 25%, then that borrower, it's our understanding, can go ahead and apply for forgiveness. If you look at the um, instructions, you will see that for the safe harbor calculations, it gives you the option to use the earlier of December 31 or the date the application is submitted. So that does seem to indicate that that's an option. If, if you're not going to avail yourself of that operating restriction safe harbor, we, we're looking for a little bit more guidance on what the process would look like. So stay tuned on that one. But again, to, um, to Mark and Eric's point, um, we'll just need to, to wait a couple more weeks and let some of the guidance flush out. But overall, Lisa, a lot of positive news here. And, and, and potentially, is, we, we think there's going to be you know, more, you know, and maybe another IFR coming out shortly related to these applications. So that will help out then the FAQs. Maybe that's in the next seven days or so. But as we've seen with a lot that's come out so far, it, it's, it's been favorable. It's been favorable around forgiveness and supporting uh, the ability to have this PPP loan forgiven. Absolutely. And, and again, I think they are um, anxious to simplify the process to the extent that they can. Thanks, now, Lisa. So we've got now uh, on to the loan forgiveness calculator. Absolutely. So we are hard at work updating the calculator based on these new provisions with the interim final rule coming out this week and answering some questions. We're building all of that into the calculator and um, hope to have it up early next week. We'll also be producing that simple version for borrowers with no employees. So we will be communicating via LinkedIn and Twitter once that is available. So that's a great way to, um, to get the, the first news once it is live and up and running. We just want to make sure that we run uh, different examples through the calculators to make sure that Good to go when you all get it. Well, thanks, Lisa. And w just regarding the forgiveness uh, calculator and tools, there are going to be more tools uh, for the forgiveness process, tools such as helping uh, to do the, the actual application form, get the, the client signatures. So that's something that uh, you can expect, and we'll, we're going to try to talk more about that over the next couple of uh, town halls. But what we want to talk about now is just the June 30th deadline for loan applications. We want to acknowledge that we know some local national lenders are still accepting applications, while some banks have stopped taking them, so we're aware of that. And if you're in a situation where your client, uh, it, their bank has stopped taking new PPP loans, FinTech's a good viable option. We mentioned Biz to Credit uh, last week, so you can find them at biz2credit.com. And, to, and I spoke, we've spoken, to, we spoke to Biz to Credit over the last 24 hours. We know they're still accepting new customer applications. Uh, we, we were in contact with them over the last hours. We know that they are uh, supporting existing QuickBook customers, and they're they're in the process of potentially expanding. To TurboTax, it should be its type of TurboTax clients in coming days, but they're, it's more about their existing customers. And then there are a number of other fintech companies still accepting. Uh, just leverage online search, Cabbage, others, pay, uh, PayPal, um, and and let us know. You can reach out to us as well, and, and we'll we'll keep our our current list of uh, of, one, of of fintech providers that we know are supporting. Uh, new new applications. I want to now bring uh, Dixie into the discussion uh, and just let her provide her perspective on what her firm is doing related uh, to supporting new applications. And I've got a we've got a number of questions here, so Dixie, we can make this a back and forth. But what are you doing right now? How are you reaching out uh, to prospects or to to clients who who potentially still may need 
some business relief and did not apply to PPP? And, and what's your offer strategy? Yeah, Eric, so for us, it really is a 10-year marketing uh, strategy related to what's the lifetime value of these customers. We saw the need to help them immediately. Our phones immediately started ringing off the hook, and uh, they are continuing. Our clients need help and guidance, and so they've been spending hours and hours trying to navigate themselves. So like most firms, we have two options with our clients. They can do it themselves, or they can have an advisor who helps walk them through it. So uh, more than ever, we have seen not only the PPP programs we've offered um, and being able to productize our services like that for both the PPP calculation and still helping identify those that haven't gotten it yet. We've still got appointments being set, um, helping sole proprietors get it. And then also with the forg forgiveness calculator, what that looks like, how that package works, but more than ever, us being the trusted advisor and doing financial analysis and CFO consulting, we've been building tools like a break-even analysis. A lot of our clients right now are wondering, okay, what do I need when my sales are down to be able just to survive? And how many sales do I need to just do break-even? And how long is the money going to last? So not only in making sure it's getting forgiveness if it's over eight weeks or 24 weeks, but how are we going to survive through the end of the year and through next year? And so we've created some cash flow forecasting tools and options for them. And our biggest challenge was that we do daily, weekly, and monthly accounting services for our clients every day. But how do we not just include this in the scope? Or should we for those clients that pay us monthly services in premium? And so learning how to scope, learning how to communicate to the clients, learning how to create an environment that scales that client service delivery was one of our biggest challenges. And so leveraging our marketing assets, leveraging our groups and client communications has been more important than ever. I think that we, while we are a digital firm and we work remotely and we're able to shift, we still didn't use all the digital tools as, as well as we could have. So that's really helped us uh, with our game. In addition, the last five years of those potential clients and leads that we've had in our customer relation management database, they are now coming to us and ready to move to the cloud and moving to a remote workforce and using all the digital tools like that, uh, now more than ever are ready to outsource. And so <clears throat> outsourcing their accounting and finance is a big deal right now to be able to cut costs and cut headcount and those that they don't need anymore and the ones that can't keep up with the financial analysis that they need. We're trying to put together those programs that make it very easy for them to choose us in the sales cycle on that. So servicing our existing clients, looking for new ones and productizing services that aren't our ongoing bread and butter clients, that's really what we're doing. Well, that's great. And, you know, I'm going to even bring Dixie a thank you for that, that, that perspective. And a question, you know, just bring a question in from the audience. Um, and you may have received this as you reached out to some of your, your prospects. Here's a business that was, they were down during the last few months. Uh, they are open and they've, they've, they're receiving some pent up demand, but they're concerned about, you know, still what does this mean? Uh, for the uh, the next couple of months, how would you handle that question? A lot of uncertainty. So they've got a lot of uncertainty um, in their economic uh, outlook, uh, but they they have they've got some some business that's coming in due to pent up demand. We mean the firm or the client, Eric? Right. This is, I'm sorry. This is a client question about applying for the PPP loan over the over the next 12 days, stating um, they they had they had some real issues. They've had they've opened up now just recently uh, based on the fact that they could due to state orders. They got some pent up demand of business, but they've got a lot of concerns. Will they be able to uh, you know make it through the the next couple of months? Yeah, what we're advising our clients really is to make sure to uh, understand whether or not you're impacted. But we definitely think that if they are going to have issues, especially in the next several weeks and next few months that are going to be impacted by this to go ahead and apply. Um, we think that uh, keeping payroll is very important for clients and making sure that the cash flow to sustain the business 
um, is, is very important as well. So we're still helping clients apply even yesterday and today with those online lenders that you mentioned. Lendio has been the one that's been uh, the most responsive for, for especially our sole proprietors. So those clients and customers we talked to weeks ago who didn't think they would be impacted are now coming back to us saying, I think I am actually impacted and I do want to apply, and we're helping them do that. Okay, and I'm just even just – we're going to I ask you the next question, but just one coming in here. Is advising clients on the eight week or twenty four week is is best best for individual clients? Any any perspective on that, Dixie? That's the hardest one for me, Eric, just because it's the newest one. We're still modifying the deliverables that we have on those calculators. I don't have my head around it exactly of which one to choose. We've got one client that was very vigilant in making sure the eight weeks were going to get forgiven, and they are continuing to use the eight weeks. We've got other clients that were not going to hit it. So the majority of the ones that we calculated on the very first um, iteration of the forgiveness, they were none of them were going to hit the 75%. The average was 60 to 62%. So we were all of a sudden coming up with cash flow strategies of which ones to pay more payroll and pay more bonuses. Some clients have chosen to go ahead and pay those bonuses and hit the eight weeks. Other clients have gone, yay, I'm glad I didn't pay bonuses because we're going to go for the 24 weeks. So I think each individual client is different. And for us, we're trying to see the calculator to calculate both the eight-week and the 24-week and advise the client to make the best decision for them. Okay, thanks. Well, let me just, Mark, I'm going to bring, we're going to go back to uh, Dixie in a second, but here's a, just one that I think we might have been wanting to mention earlier, so I'll throw it to you. Tax treatment. What's the expected tax tax treatment of the forgiveness loans? Where does that stand? So the tax treatment is uh, still in flux. Uh, there's been a couple of uh, proposed bills around that. It is probably going to get wrapped up in uh, whatever this uh, you know version four paycheck PPP 2.0 whatever that legislative bill is, so it, the earliest would be, what, end of July, maybe August, I think, our D.C. folks have said. Uh, so it's still in flux. And I know, you know our members are, and your clients, they're all worried about their estimated tax payments and they want to get that in. They want to do it based on, with payroll being one of their number one costs, whether or not in those eight weeks that they – uh, have a deductible expense or not. I, we realize that. We have been pushing hard to do this. There is strong bipartisan support to get a bill passed to make the, the uh, expenses deductible. However, there is some bipartisan opposition as well. And so it's really uh, in a state of flux. It will not be an overwhelming uh, vote like we received in getting the Flexibility Act in because there are some out there who believe that it's a double dip. If you're giving them the benefit of forgiveness and giving them the deductibility, we keep pushing for that. Uh, but the earliest we're probably going to see an answer to that is probably end of July, August at best. Okay, thanks, Mark. And just there's a number of questions that are coming in, and I think these are important for us to address. We talked about these in, in previous town halls, but just since there's only 12 days left, I want to just make sure the audience is kind of clear on them. But here's a question that some some firm had an instance where uh, they did not recommend that a client uh, take the PPP given sub sub subsequent audit of PPP. You know, as more, it, it, do they have access to line of uh, line of credit? Kind of in the liquidity question, that you know, uh, FAQ 46 came out. If you if it's a below two million dollar loan, there's not any liquidity test. It, it's it's more about what Dixie just described, uh, uncertainty, you know, impact due to the current economic uh, client. So those are clients you should really go back to right now and uh, make sure that they that they really make the right decision related to this business relief option, because it is going to end on June 30th, and the next program, if they do have another program, is going to have different criteria. So, Mark, Lisa, any, or Dixie, anything you want to add on that? Yeah, I'll take it. You know, and Eric, you're, you're spot on for that, going back to them. I think one of the, the fears that we have to get over is, did we give our clients, quote, unquote, bad advice way back when we said, don't take it, or they were skittish about taking it. We said, okay, if you're skittish, don't do it. 
uh, you know, programs change. Uh, Flexibility Act, first and foremost, and now even with the application and the ease of the application, uh, I think that with all that said, it's a new day. And so these are things that we have to look at. 24 weeks is a long time. Uh, so, you know, we think that it should be fairly reasonable for most companies to be able to uh, get forgiveness, even if uh, they are under uh, restrictions right now on, on getting back up and running full time. But, uh, you know, that's the whole issue with this program is that, you know, they keep building this airplane in the air, as you like to say, Eric, and uh, there, there's going to be these types of changes. And when the FAQs come out, you have 13 ish days to to get uh applications in um you know it's time to have those conversations dixie i know you're having those conversations did that come up at all any of your clients that uh didn't do it now say they they should yeah mark you know this is one thing that i'm very passionate about i believe that our profession in general is sometimes very hesitant to tell what we think when we don't know the answer for sure and so did we give it bad advice to our clients? The answer is definitely no. We're very experienced in SBA loans. We help them negotiate with banks all the time. It's based on that experience that we're going to give them our best guidance. Even though on a Friday night, we knew exactly how to calculate it and to include 1099s, and then on a Sunday, the calculation was wrong and had already applied with some clients, that's not giving bad advice. And so, what I want in in our profession for sure is to help us realize that clients want help They want to witness our thoughts as things are changing, and they want education to know that we can share with them our knowledge that they are going to be able to make a smart business decision. So giving our advice, even though it may change, and also if you look back two weeks ago, it's something different than it was today, the key to this is a different form of communication. This is not just one time a year. This is in the daily, weekly, and monthly heartbeat of our clients' businesses, and that's turning into the trusted advisor. Clients are more than willing to pay for it. In fact, they can't find the talent that we have in our firms to be able to do it. So we can charge for it. We can put them on a retainer. We can offer subscription to have our advice and guidance. And we can create programs that drip this information and continue to educate them, much like this town hall is educating all of the accountants right now. We should be educating our clients in this type of form, too. So I don't think we've given bad advice. I think we give, gave the best advice as we could. And that's one thing we learned from the BP oil spill is that you've got to communicate that this is a new thing and things are going to change. And we're going to offer you our best advice as we go, but we're not going to forget about you. We're going to continue to share. So it's definitely not bad advice. And Dixie, that was great. Great summary. And this is, this is kind of, it's going to continue. It's going to continue. Uh, There's going to be more business relief programs. You look at this chart in the far right. There were some idle questions today. We, we, we got into idle last week. There's the employee retention credit. Uh, that's something that businesses that are not taking advantage of PPP are, are looking at. There's tools out there related to that. AISPA is putting tools out. Mark, anything uh, that you want to highlight related to all of these different business relief options that, that hasn't been said? Keep Things keep changing, right? Uh, the idle loan, we talked about this last week. We said uh, there were 5 million loans applied for under idle, of which they only had about a million, 1.1 million processed at that time. They continue to work on those. Uh, so if your client hasn't heard, uh, they still may, and they've opened it back up. So if there are clients that uh, are still looking for an idle, uh, it is still it is now available again. Uh, beyond just uh, the farming industry, which is what they had limited there for a little piece of time. The other piece of news is the Main Street Lending Program, and we've gone back and forth. We covered it in a little more detail last week. Uh, It is still not available to borrowers. It is still pending for them. However, the lender registration has opened up. So we'll see if the lenders uh, take advantage of it. Lending community wasn't thrilled with the initial terms. They improved the terms. Still don't know that the improvements that they made, however, are going to make it attractive enough for lenders to want to do it and for borrowers to want to get it. So that's what we have so far. Thanks, Mark. So, Lisa, you've, I mean, there's lots of, we've got 445 questions I'm always looking at. We've got a lot of questions that are coming in. Uh, so I'm going to let you pick one. I'll just pick one here. There's a simple one. Uh, my bank, you know, this is coming in, you know, we're, since loans have been out there, my bank is already charging me interest on PPP loan. 
uh, will this be will this be included in forgiveness? I'll throw that to you, Lisa. Then I'll let you uh, choose a couple. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Yes, the the bar uh, the bank can be um, assessing interest currently, but that is eligible for forgiveness. So that will fall into the calculation. Um, Eric, could you go back and mention some of the fintech options? for um, companies that are accepting PPP applications. I know that Dixie mentioned Lendio. Yeah, so let, we should spell these out. Uh, bit one, I can, I could jump back uh, to that, to that, to that slide uh, I just did. Um, and biz to credit is, is taking, so it's, it's B-I-Z, the number two credit. Dot com. They're taking them. How do you, Dixie? How do you just? Why don't you just give the spelling of of, of that other uh, fintech? Yes, L E N D I O dot com. L E N D I O dot com. So we will, and we can post. We'll put a couple of these. Uh, at least one with only twelve days left. Why don't we? We'll post a couple, and there's some links that we can post uh, to others that are keeping track of some of the uh, the different. Uh, available lenders. You can always you can use use Google. Um, so a lot of a lot of your clients are leveraging into it. So into it supporting QuickBook customers, Biz to Credit supporting uh, new customers, Lendio uh, new customers as well. And uh, so I don't have any anything else to add there except that I, as I said, there's going to be additional tools coming out in the in the fintech community that we might be involved with that are gonna help with the, the forgiveness process. We also have a recommendation from one of our um, participants for Cabbage, K-A-B-B-A-G-E. I did check their site earlier today and at least on the face of it, it appears that they are also still accepting PPP applications. Yep, I've heard good things there as well. Yep, um, no endorsements, right? Uh, we've also gotten a lot of questions about the July 15th tax deadline, so a little off topic, but obviously on the minds of a lot of our participants today. You want me to take that? Sure. So the issue is with the July 15th, uh, you know, uh, we had surveyed our members and in typical CPA form, Half our members wanted us to keep the 715 deadline to push for that, and the other half said, no, extend it beyond some other date beyond July 15th. Now, there's uh, some tax group, I can't remember the name of, Eric, you may remember, uh, but it, uh, this tax group actually was advocating to extend the filing due date all the way to April of 2021. And we're like, absolutely not. A lot of our members, if that is the option, many are saying, no way. Uh, we're going to push to try and keep the July 15 deadline. A lot of practitioners I've talked to, they're trying to push their clients. They realize clients, they love deadlines too and being last minute. Uh, but, you know, if we tell them now that all indications are that July 15 is coming and we should get done, maybe that'll push them along a little bit. Um, part of the issue is, Will the IRS be up and running and capable of being able to administer a July 15 deadline? Uh, and that's playing out in that a little bit too. Uh, they're feeling more confident today that they're gonna be able to do that, but that is still a risk factor as well to push it out a little bit more. But our, uh, our stance right now uh, is to try and keep it to July 15th. Uh, Mark, Lisa, I'm going to just take one maybe while you're looking looking at the list. One, because we've talked about this with the lending, we have, we're on we we're on a call with like 50 payroll lending uh, partners today, and it was about loan, this question about loan documentation and you know 941s and you know what 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 exactly you know some some aren't coming out till later in the year. What should I do? We're going to work on an updated forgiveness. Um, uh, documentation recommendation that we're going to work on with the payroll and lending community. We, we do want, just like we did with the application process, we want a clarity there, we want a common approach. Good questions. Let us, I'd almost say, give us the next couple of weeks to come back and really give you some more clarity on what the lenders are going to be looking to, looking for from a documentation standpoint. 
there's, lenders right now really aren't processing forgiveness applications, so I think this is something that we, we can wait on, and we'll work on that. We're going to work on that with the lending community as well as the payroll community. Uh, there, there could be some you know, standard payroll compliance reports and lots of discussions around that. So, Lisa, and maybe another question that you want to select? Yeah, um, we've, we've gotten several questions about how retirement contributions are going to be factored in payroll costs eligible for forgiveness. If you're paying your 2019 contribution in 2020 during your covered period, is that an eligible cost? That should probably have stayed on my um, top question slide because I, I, we don't have good clear guidance on that one yet. So we'll keep that as an open question and anticipate getting some an FAQ about it. Um, we also were getting questions about how an idle advance plays into a PPP loan. And uh, because it's not listed on the face of the forgiveness application, um, there's some confusion as to whether or not the idle advance will be deducted from the PPP forgiveness. If you look at the instructions for the application, line 11, um, Note, if applicable, SBA will deduct idle advance amounts from the forgiveness amount remitted to the lender. So for some background on that, um, on the front of the application for forgiveness, you will, um, the borrowers will be asked to indicate if they had an idle loan and what the number is. SBA has indicated that um, the reason the actual amount isn't listed on the face of the application is because the SBA believes that it'll be in a better position to know what the idle advance was. And rather than relying on the borrower who may or may not have um, recorded it as an idle advance, they'll just use the information they have for that, um, for that calculation. We also um, have another recommendation for an, a FinTech Lender appears like Blue Vine might be an option. That is B L U E V I N E dot com. Lisa, so, uh, we um, yeah. put a lot of applications through Blue Vine early on, but last week we got several rejections that so they weren't taking anymore. Okay. So it may depend on the day. Somebody got their money in three days. So keep yeah. trying, so I think, is the, uh, is the, the lesson learned there. Mark, a question on accounting for PPP. Oh boy, I threw out all my accounting notes too. Yeah, uh, no. There are uh, four options to it. There's a great JFA article. I don't remember Lisa the day that that ran, uh, but there was a, a great summary article on that. You can treat it as a loan. If it's a not-for-profit, treat it as a grant. Uh, on the loan, as far as the forgiveness and any type of gain from forgiveness, not until the uh, forgiveness uh, is materially uh, satisfied, uh, the, the uh, rules behind it, uh, do you recognize any type of gain? Uh, we would anticipate that for the majority of our clients with a 24-week run, if they're taking it out to the 24 weeks or they need the 1231 uh, safe harbor, that by year end, they should hopefully be able to have the liability that was set up and the subsequent gain to offset it all in the same year. But if not, then uh, you'll have some carryover. Of course, you got monthly and quarterly financial statements. A lot of not-for-profits are June 30 year ends. Uh, you can set it up as a contingent grant, uh, but there's a three-page document, Lisa. Is that on the uh, PPP website for us? It is, but there's also a link in the slides that everyone got today. We've got a link to the borrower accounting J of A, and then that'll link you back to the um, original guidance. And that's at the end, under the resources, I assume? It's um, at the beginning of the slide deck, slide five for everyone. We um, did a little throwback Thursday of what we covered the last couple of weeks. So you'll see that link on the June 11th. Um, Session. So Lisa, and, Mark, um, let me just follow up on that one really quickly. We will be uh, devoting more time to borrower accounting as additional guidance is released. Our um, ANA team is, is working hard with some of the standard setters 
to get additional guidance around governmentals and other particular circumstances. So stay tuned um, and, and we'll have a longer conversation at a future event. Thanks, Lisa Mark. So what, I'm going to take one more question related to kind of just this uncertainty and just you know the idea of you know getting final final applications in. Here's one: if a, if a, if a, if a, if a one of our clients got a loan under two million, there was uncertainty then. Uh, looking back, that 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 business did not go down. You wasn't that was you didn't have to say you were going down to get a PPP loan, and now they're do, they're healthy. Um, will they be be able to get relief? And the, the, what we've stated all along is you document what the forecasts are, document the uncertainty, and, and that, that, is what it, that is basically uh, what is required, and you, you should be in, uh, in a position then if you follow through with the forgiveness application process uh, to have that, that, loan, that loan forgiven. One thing people are saying, how do you stay in touch, uh, stay current between uh, our town halls? Uh, Lisa mentioned this earlier. We are leveraging social media. You see on this open forum slide, mine and Lisa uh, and Mark's uh, Twitter handles as well as Dixie's. So you can look, you know, at the AICPA where we're, we're, Lisa I, and Mark are keeping current with what's coming out. And we also are now going to go to just talk a little bit about our, our resource centers. We've got this center. This is probably the most visited site right now on AICPA.org, AICPA.org backslash SBA. Um, uh, Lisa and her team and many others at the AICPA uh, keep this up to date. And a lot of work that goes into this town hall is, is by this, this greater team. So a lot, a lot of good work being done. Uh, Mark here, we, we're kind of now in the final two-minute stretch here. Comment on uh, loan forgiveness matrix? Yeah, I mean, these are the types of services that are out there, advisory versus uh, AUP, agreed upon procedures. Uh, we've talked about this a number of times on these town halls. Uh, again, there's a link here to uh, documentation on our website, but based on the types of services we do for our clients today, what are the types of services we can do? A lot of what uh, Dixie talked about would fall into that uh, advisory category, and I'm starting to wonder how many AUP engagements we're going to actually get with the client or even with the bank, given the easy form and the documentation that the payroll companies are going to give, but you know, if you're asked, then there's still possibilities to it. Thanks, Mark. Uh, going on, it, it's broader than just, you know, what's going on with PPP. There's a tax resource center here, uh, which also has some tools uh, that you can leverage to, to look at the different business relief options to, to look at, you know, some, some, of, the, some of the tax credit uh, that, that's available. So just in, uh, in wrap up here, what a critical time. I mean, Dixie, you said it so well on what you're doing, uh, building, you know, as you said, uh, future, you know, 10-year ten, ten relationships. This this has been a time, defining time, uh, to support uh, the the small businesses. It's it's working. Um, it, it the historic level levels of funding going out. Uh, there's been there's been issues, um, but the 44,000 firms have played a big role in kind of helping uh, their clients navigate this. We're going to continue to update uh, our resources. Uh, our next town hall is next Thursday, uh, 3 p.m. And I want to thank Dixie uh, for her time today. Thank you very much. And Mark and Lisa, uh, thank you. And, and also everyone who supports putting all this information together. We hope you all have a, a good week. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your engagement. We look forward to staying in touch. Thanks. Bye.